Hello everyone, my name is Jaime Martins, I'm from uh, the University of Algarve, and I'm going to give you a short talk on designing efficient deep learning models for small data sets. So this is uh, this is more like when when we started doing this, it was more like a challenge. I, I talked this with Professor Hui, and uh, we started we started on a data set of oranges. Basically, they had a small data set um, with oranges, and the challenge was, can we do deep learning on a very small data set? So we did. Uh, this was published in 2022. So this is the, pre the pre my presentation is based on, on the paper. So it's SpectreNet 53, a deep residual learning architecture for predicting soluble solids content with this new spectroscopy. Um, so basically, this was the, the data set was was uh, was built from uh, reading the spectra using portable spectrometers on three. Okay, so this was measured on three in the field. Uh, this is basically a representation of the setup. We had a cup, uh, then an interactance probe. You would put the orange inside the cup through a slit, then close it, and then measure the spectra on the tree. So this is this is spectra that is, uh, some of them uh, say they have sunlight contamination, so they are not measured inside the lab where you can control all the variables when you are reading them. So these are spectra that are, um, that are, um, how do I say it? They, they have, a, some of them will be noisy, okay? So this is the type of spectra we have. This is already converted into absorbents. Okay. So we had, the, of course, this is like in oranges. One of the hard things to do is is estimate the soluble solids content from spectra because the, the orange peel is very thick. So what you are measuring is the spectra of the peel, not the spectra of of the pulp inside the fruit. So basically, you are, you are estimating. Uh, estimating the sugar, the sugar content mostly from the, the peel of an orange. So this is what the, the kind of information we had. Uh, here we can see the, the first part, the, the influence of the coral peel. So the end about here. And then this is the noisy part of the spectrum. So one of the, 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 the things that we wanted to do is that uh, we know that for PLS, we have to do a lot of pre-processing uh, perspective. And one of the, 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 major, the major things that we should strive to do with deep neural networks is, is have some, some robustness to that. So uh, we have no pre-processing steps. We, don't, we also don't filter, um, we don't filter out wide and we input to the network the whole, the whole thing. So basically, we don't we don't cut uh, the the start and the end. We also include the noisy parts where where the the, the spectra the readings are mostly mostly uh, garbage, but there's still some usefulness to that. So we put those as well. So this was done. Um, this was done for for uh, we have four uh, validation conditions. So these are two orchards. Okay two different orchards and two consecutive years. So this is uh, data sets A, B, C, and D. So Padern year one, Padern year two, Quartel year one, and Quartel year two. So this is the, 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 the BRICS distribution of each of, these, uh, each of these partitions, okay? So we had 16 and, and 16 oranges, 174 for this one, 125, 192, and 125. Okay, so what we did here, uh, so we, we did a uh, deep learning method. I will get into that. But uh, we had two, two things that we wanted to, to research. Basically, we wanted to research uh, and divide our data into an internal validation set and an external validation set. And this is the external validation set that I'm showing to you here. Basically, what we define as external validation is that 
we would train on one of these partitions and we would validate with the other. So basically we all would always validate with a different orchard or with a different ear from the same orchard. So we had 28, 28 conditions. I'm showing here the external validation. We also trained um, with internal validation conditions that would be inside a, a partition. We would train with 80% and test with 20%. Uh, this was then for uh, two architectures, Deep Spectra and SpectraNet 53. Uh, each of these, each of these box plots is um, the representation of 30 networks. So we didn't fix, uh, we didn't fix our our random number generator. We we did we trained 30 networks in each condition, and then we would uh, statistically compare them. Okay. So basically, this is what the results that we got. So for the external validation results, and this was what we were most interested in, is that we got uh, for RMSEC, we got a little better than POS. Of course, this is POS. We know that it, it is very good on, on a small number of, of, uh, of spectra. But so the result was on slightly better. But it was 11.6% better in the SDR and 28% better in the coefficient of determination. So there were some improvements um, from compared to PLS, but the, the big thing is that we wanted to know if this, it was possible to do this. Okay. So what we did, we trained a 53 layer architecture. Okay. This is a 50 layer deep learning architecture. It had it's a 1D and it has 1.3 million parameters. Okay, so it's one 1.3 million parameters on uh, on 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 sometimes uh, trained on one 174 samples, 125 samples, so a very small number of samples. And compare it the the length of a spectra. A spectra was uh, around 1400. Uh, 1400 um, wavelengths, it's like almost uh, 1000 more parameters than each spectra had of information. So how can we do this and it still works? This is basically the challenge. So before we get into that, uh, we had this, this is based on, on a residual unit architecture. So you may already know that that uh, that configuration. We had six residual units, and uh, what we did is that our uh, nonlinear function was a GAL. It's a Gaussian error linear unit. Okay, so this they had some properties that we were interested. In. We will I will show you, and we also use the batch normalization after each convolutional layer. Okay, so the overfitting challenge. Uh, we know that deep learning models with many parameters tend to overfit when trained on small data sets. So in spite of that, we mostly avoided overfitting. Uh, so some of some of the, the, the splits what we did, it was we were training this network on 125 to 192 spectra. So uh, we also did uh, <coughs> like overfit resistance results, meaning that if the first thing is that we, we only trained these networks 10 epochs, okay? So this was, was an, a, a nearly stop condition to avoid overfit, but what if we trained them longer? Would, would, they, would they still uh, have, have some robustness to overfit or would they start overfitting? So this is the example from deep spectra and from our network, and we, what we found out is that uh, we trained them or 1,000 and 1,000 epochs, or until we get like 10 consecutive epochs where the the the, the loss wouldn't decrease in that uh, in that period. So we got good results here. This is we we have two networks because. Uh, this is SpectraNet 53 is the network that it has, it only it predicts SSC. And we also have a SpectraNet 6 that predicts uh, six, six outputs, okay? So 
we, we also found out that predicting six outputs was much better than only predicting one because you will have some shared representation between the outputs and that helps uh, the generalization. So the network we have done very well, even when, when trained uh, many more efforts, okay? In contrast, the deep spectra was also, was also, it's an inception architecture. It's also very, uh, an interesting architecture, but uh, we found out that after the longer we would train it, the more it started to overfitting and then the results would uh, would be much worse, okay? So this is, I'm, I'm giving you this in a, a very quick fashion, but this is explained more deeply in the, the, the article, okay? So, what can we do in terms of, of an, a computer science approach to prevent deep, learn, deep, uh, deep learning architectures from overfitting? So, one of the first things is that a type of, of uh, architecture based on residual units or something like that. So, we know that residual units, uh, they work very well to create, to create uh, a longer architectures because we can stack them and still have these skip connections or have identity connections that uh, can be used to propagate information forward. Okay, so that the 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 higher teacher spaces would be would be uh, would still have access to 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 lower feature space information. Okay, um, and prevent exploding gradients. So this was one of the first things. The other thing is that we wanted to increase the number of channels as we go deeper. So we used both skip connections uh, with uh, simple and with convolutional, uh, convolutional where by one times one. Okay, so that we could help the activation and upset of the, the channels. And also, of course, batch normalization to help increase the, 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 the help increase the, the, the time that we could um, help in, increase the, the, so that we didn't have to train them longer, okay? So another thing interesting was, was jealous. So this is used as a non-way activation function and it works inputs by magnitude instead of getting them, okay, what realm. And uh, one of the interesting things about GALS is that it acts as a stochastic regularizer, okay? So that it's, it's, we also have implicitly some kind of regularization at each time we do a non-linear activation function inside the network. Of course, we also tried uh, different approaches to the SNP. We, we use something we call the quantile normal value transform. It's also uh, in the paper, basically, it, it, was, it was a little more robust to apply than the standard s &V. okay? Another interesting thing that we did was using immediately batch normalization after the input layer. So that is not very common yet to do that, but it works because you can, uh, you can apply learnable scaling and shifting to what you are getting at the input, okay? It's basically during the training, you're basically fine tuning uh, a data, spe data set specific normalization. Okay. Another interesting thing by doing this is that it also works as a form of data augmentation because for every batch, for every mini batch that we put to the network, the statistics will be different. So for the same sample, you will have it, it, when it is input in different batches, it will be uh, slightly different. Multi-objective learning, like I said, we predicted six outputs simultaneously. That gave us better results than just predicting one. And of course, the usual suspects, we also did L2 regularization, so weight decay. We had a dropout way with 25% drop probability. We also used gradient clipping. Uh, so to, we wanted to avoid exploding gradients and also that could allow us to train with a, a, a higher learning rate at the start because we, we wanted to do only 10 epochs, okay? That, that allow us to do that and a low sample mini batch size, okay? Because we also have very low amount of spectra to work with 
our batches batch size had to be uh, small. Okay. Thank you. These are the two papers we published with this architecture. This is the one with oranges, and that is uh, another one with peers. We have time for one quick question, then we go to lunch, and you can corner and me. ask him things. So, any quick question? Yes, um, So, you mentioned you always get what 30 maps that you um, train again with different uh, random implementations. Yes. Can you compare when you, when you predict the, let's say, the same orange with the 30 different maps? What kind of variance you get in the predictions to the orange to orange procedure or prediction error variance? Um, I mean, well, what what we did there was we we did this type of we, we presented that information mostly like this so basically uh orange to orange uh, oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. yeah I'm so sorry. basically what uh, not yeah. not orange to orange but this is the 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 root mean square error of prediction and, and this is the distribution of the root mean square of prediction between the 30 networks, okay? So basically what we wanted, what we wanted to see is that if we train 30, if, if, if they're really stable, you would expect something like this. So, so it, yes. it would collapse to box squat. Yeah? And if the training was, if the training was prone I'm to overfit, yeah. It will it goes up because it, it's overfitting sometimes, so to some data, not to the other. So that basically, yeah. Uh, and, and of course, we have also here not to the and the shaded regions are the ninety five percent confidence interval, so that we can compare them on on the graph, and and they are really they are really compact. Uh, but yeah. Okay. Thanks again. Yeah.